All right, welcome back to part five. Now the article states at this point that John 10, 27 through 30 is one of the strongest passages for eternal security. Before we read that, I wanna try and illustrate something about security though. Let's say you lock up your house at night, but you don't just stop there. You deadbolt it, put bars on the windows, and board up the doors and set your alarm. You basically fortify your house. Are you secure in there? Sure. It'd be hard for anyone to pluck you out of your house now, wouldn't it? But what if you left all that in place and turned off the alarm and then walked out the front door? Guess what? You're no longer secure in your house. You may be close to it, but you've just stepped out. So keep that in mind as we read the scripture. John 10, 27 through 30 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hands. I and my Father are one. So maybe that seems a little tough to refute. After all, it says it right here. No man can pluck them out of my hands. But let's look a little closer at what he's saying and what the word pluck means here. To pluck would be to snatch or take by violence. In fact, it is the same word in Greek, harpazo, that is used for what we call the rapture today. And just for the record, something else to pray about. I believe the pre-trib rapture is another dangerous false teaching. And maybe, Lord willing, we can get into that later down the road. But I want to stay on topic here. So the context in John 10 here is the Jews were confronting Jesus about who he was. Some had even called him a devil. But in John 10:24 it says, Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you believe not, because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. And then Jesus proceeds to tell them that his people know who he is, and they follow him. You Jews who are trying to discredit me and subvert my message will not succeed. What he's saying is not you, nor Satan, nor anyone else for that matter, can pluck them out of my hands. But that word pluck again is a conditional thing here. This requires that you remain in him. God is not the author of confusion, and it's only logical that if you step out of your fortress, you're no longer protected. You see, the once saved, always saved doctrine says no matter what, you can't lose your salvation. But to apply this text to a once saved, always saved belief, we would have to negate all free will. The Lord tells us in Psalms 18.2, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and in my high power. Psalm 91, 2. I will say of thee, Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. So it says, in him I will trust. Will you continue to trust in him? He's our tower and our fortress, but will you remain in him for protection, or will you wander off? Proverbs 21, 16 says, The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. It's a matter of choice, a matter of free will. No one can snatch you from God, but God also forces no one. We always have a choice. God is love, and He wants us to love Him in return. But true love is never by force. You can't make someone love you. That's not real love. So do we stay with Him or wander off with the congregation of the dead? See, our Father created us with the capacity to choose or have free will. And this is why we have sin in the first place. Now we're going to cover the topic of what is sin in more depth later. But simply put, we can choose to love God or not to love Him. To be with Him or to be without Him. To be with God is life eternal. To be without Him is to be in sin. Let's look at some key choices in Scripture that teach us this. We read in Ezekiel 28 the story of Lucifer or as he is called here, the king of Tyrus. Ezekiel 28, 13 through 15 says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle in gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. 
Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. So we see here that he was in the presence of God, but he made some decisions that changed everything for him. And we read more about this in Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. You see, even though he was in the presence of God, Jehovah, Lucifer chose to exalt himself. How about in the Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. But then, as we read in Genesis 3, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them were both opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So here we see again walking with God, but they made a choice to believe a lie rather than the truth. Let's move forward a few thousand years now and see where God has made a provision to reconcile his creation back to him. In another garden now sits Jesus, the Son of God, spotless lamb, faced with the task of taking upon himself the sins of the world. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death, Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little bit further, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So here we have the Son of God, yet he came as a man in the flesh. Faced with a decision, his soul was sorrowful unto death concerning what he was about to do. Now he could have walked away. But knowing his father, he knew his father's will was best for everyone. He chose to carry out the will of God. So now we have a choice. Seek the will of God or self. Holiness and righteousness or sinfulness and death. So, with that being said, let's close out with Joshua 24:15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord.